Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our wonderful little church. Have any announcements, any concerns, any joys? Don't forget next Sunday is our Sunday lunch again. Food and right. lunch and fun. Right. Um, got a meeting at the end of church today. Yeah. Congregational meeting, everybody be sure to stay. So it's a real important thing. Yes, ma'am. I, I enjoy it. Some of y'all have, have probably heard about the news already, but Gary and I are going to have a grandson. Does anybody know anything about Bob? some movement, but um, he told me that he was just disappointed in his rehab schedule. But George, his brother, has been handling all the arrangements there at the nursing home on his behalf. So I don't know if George has told him of any changes and he doesn't remember or hasn't told him. I don't know, but he is going to rehab a lot to the actual exercise room, a lot less than he was when he first went. Uh, he tells me all the time to tell everybody to call him, to tell everybody to, who can to go see him. So um, if you need his phone number, see me at the church. But he loves phone calls, and he has a new phone that he can hear better on. So um, because he won't turn the TV off when he gets on the call. <laughs> so, um, but do try to call him, even if it's just for a few minutes. He, Generally can't talk long. About five minutes is his limit at a time. But call him because he enjoys those phone calls and hearing from people uh, since he's out there basically by himself. Um, it's a little bit of a drive. But if he can make it out there, he would love to see you. Okay. Don't forget those poor people in Kentucky. Yes. In the first week of Advent, we lighted the candle of hope, reminding us that our eternal hope is in the Christ who came and who is coming. In the second week of Advent, we lighted the candle of peace. We celebrated Jesus' everlasting peace in our hearts. Today we come to light the beautiful pink candle of joy. The psalmist says, shout with joy to God, all the earth. On this special Sunday, we must remember that there is a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness relates to the outer circumstances in our lives. Joy is the deep feeling which comes from our relationship to God and which cannot be shaken by outward circumstances. Mother Teresa said, the password of the early Christians was joy, so let us still serve the Lord with joy. Joy is love, joy is prayer, joy is strength. God loves a person who gives joyfully, and if you give joyfully, you will always give more. So on this third Sunday of Advent, let our hearts be filled and guided by joy. 
Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let us pray. Loving God, our hearts are filled with joy on this Advent Sunday. Joy is ours by your great gift of your Son. Let us joyfully share the good news that Christ has come and Christ is coming. Let this good news reign joyfully in our hearts. Amen.
don't we? You better get one. Okay. Um, joy is a feeling of great happiness in School is about to be out for the holidays, and Santa's coming, and just a lot of parties, and just a lot of things going on that make us happy. But the miracle of Christmas is that Jesus is our perfect joy. And even though there's a lot of sadness going on, Jesus helps us to be happy. Um, it's pure gladness. It's being cheerful. It's being bubbly in our hearts. At Christmas, we're so busy that we forget about Jesus sometimes and think that it's all parties and gifts and visits and families and being out of school, like we said. Well, that is true. It's important that we remind ourselves the story of Jesus' birth and remember how he brings hope, peace, and joy into our lives. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, thank you for sending Jesus to bring us salvation and us joy. We rejoice because he came to live with us, in us, and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, for the joy. And Sarah wasn't here last week. We want her to have a complete set. So I'm going to give you your peace ornament. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have a tradition that for Advent, I find Advent uh, ornaments to give to the kids. Father, it is true that we get so busy in this Christmas tide season that we do, to use the quote, forget the reason. But we are here for this hour particularly to focus not on the stores, not on the shopping lists, not on the preparations in the sense of purchase, but in the preparations in the sense of our hearts. Your son, his birth is about to be celebrated and we want you to know that we shall and do adore him. That like that new firstborn baby, that new grandchild, we've all been there, we've held them in our arms, we've looked down to that face and we all know that feeling of adoration. The sense, the smell, the warmth, the comfortable feeling, the smallness of it all, and the dreams and the wonders of what the future may bring. We adore him. Father, know this day that we adore you. We adore the creation that you've created. We adore the son that you've sent and Sacrifice for us, we adore the Holy Spirit that surrounds us this day. We adore all that you have given us. And for that we give thanks. And all the wonder of it, all the mystery of it, beyond our comprehension, there is no way to take it all in other than just to adore it all. For that we do give you thanks and adoration. Amen. Well, you know how I like to say this. Our bulletin says it's now time to confess your sins. Okay? It says so in the book. Hopefully this isn't the only time this week that you shall do so. 
hopefully it will be something of a daily matter. But in the order of things that we Presbyterians like to do, now is the time that we should and do our call to confess our sins. Will you join me in the confession that's in the bulletin? Holy God, you are near, and we confess that we need repentance. We do not live in peace with your creation or your people. We have not trusted your word, and we are afraid. Forgive us, restore us, and turn our shame into praise that is shown by your forgiveness. Amen. Let us pray silently now, confessing to our Lord that which is within our hearts. Let us pray. And amen. Know this, brothers and sisters, that we have been called to confess our sins. And if we find ourselves in deep faith with our Savior, then we are forgiven. That is his promise. That is his commitment. And it is our joy to accept that forgiveness. Know this, this moment right now, you stand pure in the sight of God and in front of this congregation as well. God bless you all. Thanks be to God. Amen. shower us with your gushing, abundant water of life. Enter into our brokenness and renew us with the strength of your love. Be born anew in our hearts and in our world. Come, Jesus, come. We are all ready. Amen. Now for the first reading, Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Dear not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord our God is in your midst a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on the day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. At that time, I will gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Our second reading today is from the uh, chapter of Luke, beginning in chapter 3, verse, verses 7. However, a very similar story is told in Matthew. And I want to start off with Matthew chapter 3 because it's a good introduction into what we're about to hear today. Listen to this. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the paths for him. Now John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And people came out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Now Luke in chapter 3 begins his reading. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense unless you jump back over to Matthew because Matthew better explains the phrase. Matthew says that when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, baptizing he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? So John is talking specifically to the Sadducees and the Pharisees as vipers as those who are within the church and hold themselves higher than God oftentimes. So to continue on, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance, he tells the crowd. And we should think a little bit about what repentance is because in the Jewish gathering that's around him that day, repentance is not what we think of it as today. I mean, this repentance stuff, the way John is bringing it to the table and the way Christ will bring it is very different from the way the Jews saw repentance. To them, it really didn't have much meaning. Their tradition of the temple sacrifice was the leading factor in these times. And we might recall... Passover. It was the Sabbath by then that sacrifice was how you cleansed yourself of sins. In its original form, God established a sacrifice in what we would call it today, a sacrament kind of, in recognition of a wrongdoing or, excuse me, a wrong thinking, and as a real tactile, on hands approach to the price of sin. I think remember how it works, right? Especially at Passover. It's kind of, we don't really see a lot of this in our mind's eye. But you think about Passover, every Jew who can possibly make it to town is in town. And it's the day when they sacrifice the Passover lamb. That means, of course, there are market, there's market there in the, in the temple where you can buy a lamb. If you've traveled so far, you can't bring one with you. Or if you've come locally, you've brought your best lamb for the sacrifice. And there's this long line of people lined up, and maybe two or three, I don't know, and there are priests at the head of each line. And the patriarch is the family of the family is the one responsible for bringing the lamb to the priest and the sacrifice. And as that patriarch approaches the head of the line, he presents the lamb. The priest says a prayer and gives the sacrificial knife to the patriarch. The patriarch then cuts the throat of the lamb. Now, if you've ever been to a slaughter, you know what happens. Clearly, blood flows. Bowels loosen, bladders loosen, the smell comes forth, the animal kicks and squirms. Literally, the patriarch of the family 
has blood on his hands. Then the priests take the animal and dress it and put it on the the fire. And then the patriarch goes and washes the blood from his hands. That was the sacrament. That was the sacrifice. The family through the patriarch literally felt the death of that sacrificial lamb. And it was meant to change things. But the problem with it in the Jews was that the problem that we have today with sacraments particularly, they did it every year. Every year we would go up to temple and every year we would take up this lamb and every year we would sacrifice it. And therefore every year we are free and cleansed of our sins. Cool beans. I'm not, I haven't changed my life. I don't have to be different. Because if I do anything wrong, even if it's by accident, not a problem. Next year, I'm going to get me a lamb, I'm going to sacrifice it, and I'm good for another year. There's no much sense of a repentance as it was a cleansing. That was the focus. And over the centuries, as they came and gone in the temple, what happens to annual rituals? What happens in the church today? Annual rituals, monthly or quarterly. What happens at communion? What happens in those sacraments that almost, they become such a routine. You just go do it. You just go through the motions. It's what we do, whether it's the first Sunday or the first of the quarter or twice a year or, you know, we just go through the motions. In the case of sacrifice, the lamb has paid the price for sin. The patriarch has got blood on his hands, but then he washes it off. And later that day, that meat from that lamb is brought home with the instruction to eat it that night. Though. So the whole family gets to consume that lamb. And then you go on from there for the next year. The expectations of change in the way they live has not taken place. How can that happen? How do we find a way to change our lives? This is what John's talking about. This is where John's coming from. John's talking about real change that changes lives, not next year at the sacrifice, not next year at the temple. He's talking about change now. Not a way to get to the eraser board and just wipe it off but a way to keep from getting stuff on the board all together. How can we change? What can happen? The people of Israel at the time also felt like they had a claim about sin and repentance because the people of Israel felt like they were chosen through Abraham Because they're children of Abraham, they've got it made. They really don't have to do anything because God has already promised them the Messiah, promised them the future. They don't have to worry about living differently. They can continue all they want. And John is standing at the river saying, no, 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 no. That is not how God wants you to live. And he tells them this. He says, don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, as if, hey, man, we've got the Abraham t-shirt. We don't have to do anything. We've got the temple. We know know what to do. We don't have to worry about anything. We got it made. We're locked in. God promised us. Then, as now, many times in the Middle East, excuse me, particularly, heredity is a big deal, right? Whatever your father had, it falls through the family, and he just goes on and on and on down through the centuries. And their relationship with God is through Abraham. And as long as they have that relationship, whether it's spiritual or even genealogically, they've got it made. And John tells them that no lineage from Abraham is not enough. Sacrifice is not enough. 
lineage and family is not enough. He even reminds them that, you know, physical relationship has nothing to do with it. He goes on to, to say that, I'll tell you if God, was, God is able to raise these stones up as children of Abraham. If you think you're special because you're a child of Abraham, if God's looking for children, he can make all the children he wants. If that's all he wants is somebody to come to church or go to temple, that's easy for God. I got rocks on the ground. I can, get, I can fill the pews with people if that's all God wants. Our claim to history has nothing to do with our claim to God because the, what John wants us to do is to realize that why Abraham was blessed was because Abraham placed his faith in God. God told Abraham, I will make of you a nation. And Abraham believed him without proof, not afterwards, but before. And that is the faith that God wants from all of us without anything beforehand. God wants people of faith. God wants to be trusted. God wants to be relied on. God wants to be depended on. He wants us in our faith, in our repentance, to turn away from reliance on ourselves and rely on him. A commentary written by uh, Mr. McLaren points out in the Hebrew, when you talk about faith, it's better explained as a metaphor. That faith is like a man, weak and tired, standing against a strong staff, relying on that staff to hold him up so that he doesn't fall or fail. That is faith. And that's what is important. Paul in his letter to the Galatians says, those who have faith are the children of Abraham. And Abraham, in the example set by his faith in God, is the father of us all who place our faith in the one and only living God. All these people that are standing around the banks of the Jordan that day have come to hear this strange guy dressed in weird, that ate all kinds of weird food. Certainly he's something, that's kind of curious, let's go see what this guy looks like. I'm sure that's part of it. But he's, they're there and they're hearing him talk about repentance and changing the way your lives and bearing good fruit. And there's something, what is this about? We've never heard this before. We thought we had it made. We've got the Jew t-shirt. We go to temple. We do the sacrifices. Is there something else? And they're intrigued. And he warns them, however, that not only is this a new message, it's a critical, urgent message. And he says, even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Sorry folks, he says, you don't have till next year to do another sacrifice. You can't cover your bases later. You can't place your hope on being a child of Abraham. You have to do it now. Luke will come back to this sense of urgency later I was raised in the Baptist church, and my father was a Baptist deacon. And those of you may know the click every service, every sermon, end of the service, every eye closed, every head bowed, just as I am, on and on and on and on. Until you finally come, if nothing else, I got, got, got lunch, we got to shut this guy up, we got to get out of here, <laughs> you know. But there's a sense of urgency there. <clears throat> Jehovah's Witnesses aren't real shy about walking around, knocking on our doors with their pamphlets. Sense of urgency. Even the Church of the Latter day Saints, the Mormons, have got their young people on worldwide missions spreading their gospel. There's a sense of urgency. It's not later, it's not tomorrow, it's next year. And sometimes I worry about us 
you know, uh, decently and in good order Presbyterians, that sometimes we miss out on the pure emotional pull of call from Jesus Christ. Sometimes I think we think through it, and we analyze it, and we come to the conclusion, but we don't just get up and walk down front and say, yes, Lord, I'm yours. John, again, is saying that kinship is not enough. T-shirts is not enough. Going to church, going to temple is not enough. There must also be fruit produced. There's got to be proof. It's not enough to feel renewed inside and changed. That's cool. But we have to show it. We have to bear it. We have to wear it on our sleeves, if you will. And the people that day standing around John on that river hear all of this and his call, but they don't know what he's talking about. What do you mean bear fruits? The fruit they're associated with is the one of sacrifice later. Their perspective is to wait and do it next year. And out of interesting, the crowds ask him, what then should we do? What, what is this that we should do? If our claims to Abraham are not sufficient, what is? If going to the temple is not enough, what is? If sacrificing animals is not enough, not enough, what is? If going to church is not enough, what is? If going to Sunday school is not enough, what is? If reading the Bible is not enough, what is? And John gives them examples of what fruits of repentance really look like so they can see how to live this new life. And I think his message is not wasted on us. And in reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. In a land and a time, then as now, how much stuff you have was often a symbol of wealth and respect and position and even power, right? The more stuff you got, the more blessed you are. And John says, no, wrong again. Instead of looking out for number one, you must also look out for others. This is more important than waiting for the special church fund drive once a year to raise money for the, for the Presbyterian home. It's more important to wait in, than waiting until next year to the temple. This is a way of how you look at life every day and what you do every day. If you have two coats, share one. How many coats do you really need, John says? Especially if you see one in, someone in need of a coat. Let's not forget the metaphor here. If you have two coats, especially in these times, a cloak was an outer garment, typically a Sunday kind of thing, right? Sunday dress. It's one of your finer things, one that you're proud of. You see walking around it, you, can, you know, you got a little step going, looking good. And Jesus says, well, that's cool. John says, that's, that's good. But if you've got two of those, you should give one away to someone who doesn't have one. I don't know about you, but I identify myself with my clothes. I'm proud of my clothes. I like to dress them the best I can. And I'm sure they did then. But if you saw someone in need and you decided to get off and take off your Armani suit jacket and give it to them, haven't you really given away part of yourself, part of your pride, part of your spirit? Haven't you really, in a way, made a sacrifice of who you are for someone else? That, I think, is where John's coming from. To have two cloaks is special, to give one away means that we also give part of who we are away. And how far does that go? If your pantry has more food than you need? Hmm. If your wallet has more money? than you really need? If you have more cars than you need? What if your jewelry box has more pearls and gold in it than you need? And for a guy like me, what if my workshop has more hammers than I need? I got seven, why do I have seven hammers? Really, why do I? 
The point here is to be recreated in ourselves, to be reborn, if you will, into a life where such giving thoughts are automatic. On our sleeves. Can't help it. Just can't wait. Now is the time to do that. Now this really got under the people's skin because even taxpayers came to be baptized and they asked the teacher, what should we do? Holy mackerel. Now the taxpayers, you know, were selected by the Romans to collect taxes. That selection was made on a bidding process. They had a tax guy at the front gate, at the, at the gate to the town, and they expected X number of dollars to come out of that gate every year, and they would open it up for bids, and somebody would come by and say, okay, I'll do that job for $200 a year. And if he's the low bidder, he gets the job. And his job is to give the Romans that money. Now, what they're supposed to do, of course, is live off a commission off of what they collect. But often what they would do is upcharge, they would increase the tax so that they could scrape off the top for themselves. So not only did a tax collector work for the Romans, which put them in ill repute, but they also overcharged the taxes, which made the Jews hate them. Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Change the way you think. Change the way you live now. Don't do that anymore. Soldiers also were there and, we, and said, what should we do? I thought, that's interesting. Is there soldiers? It's, what? Soldiers are there. Problem with soldiers, they were paid 230 denarii a year, Roman soldier. The government held back 50 for gear shoes and all that kind of stuff, they held out another $60 for food. That left the average Roman soldier being paid approximately $1,500 a year in 2020 money, paid out three times a year. So it was not unusual for Romans to confiscate food, animals, bear false witness, in other words, to get money from people, it was not unusual for them to mistreat people. Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations and be satisfied with your wages. Change the way you're living now. The world is bigger than me. The world is defined as we. Killing more lambs, slaying more doves does not purchase repentance. Changing the way you treat your fellow man is where you show your repentance. And as the people were filled with expectation and all were questioned in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, you know the Messiah, right? The Jews are waiting for the Messiah to come and make everything better, right? All we gotta do is say the Jews is, Jews is hold on, when the Messiah comes, we will be set right. The prophets will be fulfilled. We sometimes think the same way about Jesus, don't we? If we can just hold on long enough, Jesus will come again. And Jesus will make everything better. And John's telling us again, no, if things are going to get better, they're going to start with you to start with you today and they're going to start with the way you think about yourself and they're going to start about the way you think about other people. This world is our responsibility. We have been given instruction on how to live it. And when we don't live it, we find ourselves in sin. We miss the target. When we find ourselves in sin, we must Confess and repent and be baptized. Changed. Changed not for something better for us, but changed for something better for the world. He was speaking like no one else had before. Now, you know the story, and I wonder in our mind's eye, you might imagine, here's John talking to the crowds around that lake, that the river Jordan. Jordan, soldiers, Sadducees, Sadducees, tax collectors, people of every day, and, and he sees over in the corner, he sees 
He's over in the corner, someone else. Someone over there standing and listening to him about being baptized and, repent, and being uh, repentance. I wonder if he sees Jesus over there, watching and listening. I baptize you with water, he says to the crown. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. And we recall that the lowest of the lowest slaves, their job was to untie the sandals of the master. And John says, I'm not even good enough for that. I wonder if they catch each other's eye and they know and they see what's about to happen. And I wonder if the urgency that is there, the sense of wonder that is there, that they realize that what's about to happen is going to change the world. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. And he goes back to this sense of urgency he began with. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Time is near. The Lord is near. Repent. Demonstrate your rebirth with good fruits. So it continues. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. And this ends the reading of the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So with many other exhortations, apparently John had a lot more to say than we hear in Mark and Luke. I wonder who else he might have addressed that day. I wonder if he talked about the money changers in the temple overcharging I wonder if he looked at the priests and talked to them about how much food they kept from themselves from the fires as opposed they gave back to the patriarchs. I wonder if he talked to the merchants in the markets selling their wares at reasonable prices or the rich man enjoying the benefits of his wealth for himself as opposed to sharing that. With Christmas time coming, the Salvation Army bell ringers are out with their red buckets. My confession, I'm really good at trying to find the other door. I am really, really guilty when I walk out of the door with my stuff, pass the red bucket, and do nothing. I'm ashamed of that. This year, I want to do better. In fact, I've been saving my change so that I now carry around in my car or in my pocket a dollar or so of quarters so that I can actually walk in the front door of the store right next to that lady or that man ringing their bell in my face and put money in it. You know, shame is an interesting factor. You find it everywhere. And that's one that I have carried around with me forever. And I'm hoping that little bit of activity is some good fruit that I might share. I wonder what John would say to me about other fruit that I don't bear. I wonder what John might say to you about other fruit you do or don't bear. Grace and forgiveness and salvation are all gifts. Repentance is that act of understanding a wrong life, a wrong path, a wrong direction, a pointless way and making a change. Repentance is knowing that we have a problem and a change is needed and that we can make that change with God's help. And in gratitude for that new path and thanks for that gospel that has been preached and shared to us and acceptance of his love and peace and joy and hope that we do repent and we dedicate ourselves to the Christ. This Christmas season, I pray that each of us might find and investigate more clearly that image that we see in the bathroom mirror when we get ready every day. 
I pray that when we look in that mirror, we find a way to see the image that God wants in that mirror. An image of thankfulness. An image of repentance. The image of a person who is ready to share the glory and the wonder of God with anyone they meet, anytime, anywhere. Even if it's a quarter at a time. We at least see someone who's not afraid to act like we are who we claim to be. Not afraid to show the fruits of hope and love and peace. Or, when we look in that mirror, will we see someone else who has not repented and has not changed and who doesn't care and remains cold to a world of people in need? It is a choice we are free to make. John tells us it's an urgent choice. We need to make it quickly. But making the choice isn't enough. We have to show the result of that decision to those that we meet. The man in the mirror is great for us, but that man in the mirror can only benefit our world if we show that to others outside our home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray that you all and we all, in our repentance and in our forgiveness, find the strength to be and become those that Christ has called us to be this season. Amen.
We seek the strength to show the fruits of your forgiveness. Father, we also ask for your intercession in those in the devastations of the storms. For those who one moment are at work and are the next moment gone. For those who are in hospital injured, for those not yet identified, for the families in distress, fear, pain, and loss. Father, we know that through you there is strength. We ask that you and the hands that you have there circling these people, their families, their friends, their cities, that those responders both in fire and sheriff and emergency, but also first responders with the name and name of Christ, shall circle them to show your compassion, to bear your fruits, to show indeed that they are not alone, but are part of a circle of life and love that we come together today in prayer to share for them. And Father, we also pray in the words your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Now is that time in our service where we call for the offering. Again, it's an opportunity to show the fruits of your love. And in doing so, exhibit that in a financial sense, we return his great offering.
Father, we give you thanks for that which you have given to us. We ask that you accept them as a sign of our repentance and fruit, that they may expand and tell from this place the great glory and gospel that you have shared and given to us this day. Amen. Will you please stand and sing doxology? sisters that when you leave this place today you leave with Jesus our Lord and Master goes with you walks with you is in your card with you and he watches what you have on your sleeve and what you do with it and I pray that we all find the strength and the willingness to share what we have with joy know this that there's no place that you can go where Christ will not be with you there is no place dark enough nor far enough that he will not come and be with you if you but ask. Share his joy with your smiles and your love in this great creation he has given us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't go anywhere. Right? <laughs> Please be seated. Congregational meeting, right? Carl Martin, and it's my privilege to call to order this congregational meeting for the First Presbyterian Church of Jacksonville. So at this time, let us begin with prayer. Loving God, thank you for this congregation, for its long-standing witness and service to this great community, and thank you for the things you are about to do with these new calls to service. 
We ask your blessing of this business in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see, where is Chelsea? Is there a quorum? There is. Okay. So when the call for this meeting, the session has placed basically two matters of business before the congregation. The election of officers in what I'll call the standing committee of the church, the nominating committee, as well as the election of the pastoral nominating committee. So I would like to divide these nominations up in that way. Um, the nominating committee has presented before you, and you all should have in your hands, um, the list of all the nominees. Um, the nominations for officers, for ruling elders for the class of 2024 are Trish Ballard, Ann Moore, and Laura Underhill. The nomination for trustee for the class of 2024 is David Talley. And then the nominations for the nominating committee for the coming year are Ann Moore, Alita Bell, Lana Boozer, Carolyn Paget, and Margaret Pope. And the nomination for the youth member is Lorelei Vesey. Are there any nominations from the floor in addition to those presented by the nominating committee? Okay. Hearing no further nominations, I will declare those nominations closed for those offices. And if we may, let's vote on those all together. All those in favor of electing the nominees as presented before you, please signify by saying yes. Yes. If any are opposed, please signify by saying no. Great. It is the ruling that those officers are elected. Congratulations. So now the second matter before the congregation is the election of a pastoral nominating committee. And the session has presented the following names for those positions. Ethelyn Brown, who is currently an elder. David Talley, who is trustee. And then Bonnie Seymour, Steve Underhill, and Lynn Vesey. Do all the nominees for those positions consent to that position? Are there any other nominations from the floor for the pastoral nominating committee? Okay, hearing no further nominations, I declare that the nominations for the pastoral nominating committee to be closed. And I would like to ask that all those in favor of electing those five nominees signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed to those nominations, please signify by saying no. It is the ruling that those nominees have been elected to be your pastoral nominating committee. Congratulations. So, Madam Secretary, for the purposes of this meeting, is there any other business before the congregation? Yeah. Wonderful. Then we will adjourn with prayer, and I would like this also to be a prayer of dedication for the calls that have just been affirmed by this congregation. Let us pray. God of things good and perfect, thank you for the gift of new beginnings, new opportunities, and for these, your children, who have answered the Spirit's call to service today. Inspire them with the wisdom to seek and discern your will. Encourage them to think and act in new and creative ways. And gift them with the unity of purpose as they serve alongside their sisters and brothers to build your kingdom right here in Jacksonville. For all that you have done for us, gracious God, and for all your blessings yet to come, we give you thanks and praise. In the name of the one who saves us and in whose name we serve, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The meeting is adjourned.